to introduce our next speaker, and I will with his uh, praise who announce uh, have only very few remarks. Professor Edwin Kanafuga is the an Ivory Ivory University <laughs> Professor of Jewish History, Literature and Law at the Shiva University's Bernard Ravel Graduate School of Jewish Studies. He is the author of five books and more than 80 articles in the fields of medieval Jewish intellectual history and rabbinic culture and rabbinic literature. His forthcoming book, Brothers from Afar, deals with rabbinic approaches to apostasy and reversion of medieval Europe. And I could now tell you lots about his books, and I'm sure you have all read them, or oh, if you haven't, you should. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, people mentioned yesterday that the organizers named all the letter E, so of course my place here is very obvious. But I do thank my colleagues very much for inviting me. Uh, we seem to move from venue to venue. We're not like you does so much. Um, and uh, I'm at home everywhere because I live on a plane. But in any case, I especially want to thank the organizers for, um, as Eva mentioned as well, uh, inviting and really helping our Dr. Anton to be here. So past and present, and uh, this is a very nice thing, and I'm really especially grateful in that regard. So now we're going to go back to internal Yura Hasid, and indeed Yura Hasid, not so much Sefer Hasidim, which is a whole other problem, and here we go. In uh, peering through the lattices, mystical, magical, and pietistic dimensions of the Thosophist period, and in the fifth chapter of the more recent intellectual history and rabbinic culture of medieval Ashkenaz, uh, I have laid out in detail points of similarity and even commonality between the German pietists and the Tosophists in both Germany and northern France. Contrary to the studies of Fry Morbach and Joseph Dahn, Tosophists were aware of and involved in magical theories and practices that centered around the manipulation and application of divine names and even with mystical teachings. And here, the Hello Corpus is a key sinor, a key conduit. We won't talk much about that now. More to come. In the area of pietism as well, there are manifestations and written expressions that are common to both groups. Clearly much of this extended from the pre-crusade period, but the appearance of the German pietists during the 12th century served to spur on these developments in certain Tosophist circles, even as others completely avoided them, and a number of these practices and teaching become even more prominent in the Tosophist literature of the 13th century, and what you heard yesterday from Yudinsky, <coughs> in terms of Satan and Sol Katan is a good example of that. To be sure, there are a range of mystical, magical, and pietistical practices and theories, pietistic practices and theories, that were embraced by Hasidic Ashkenaz alone, who greatly extended the parameters of these disciplines beyond even what they had been in the pre crusade period. At the same time, however, as I have argued in a number of places, it is also inaccurate to portray the leaders of the pietists as largely disinterested in the methods of the Tosophists in the Germany or in France. This means much more than simply asserting that the pietists also studied the Torah and the Talmud and discussed matters of Jewish law, or that they engaged in traditional modes of the experience of study. For all of its concern with Tosaf's dialectic not falling into the hands of improperly trained students and scholars, especially given the possible intellectual reputational abuses that this method could generate, I will say Sefer Chassidim, Sefer Chassidim had no difficulty with the dialectical method employed by qualified, competent Tosafists or with the Tosafot that were produced. Quite to the contrary, Sefer Hasidim recommends that a teacher of Talmud share copies of the Tosafot text that he possesses with his competitors, his educational competitors, and that a person who comes across Tosafot texts in his business travels, uh, here's a case of traveling through business, but he clearly came back to the so you're right, uh, which he knows are not available in his hometown, these texts are not available, Sefer Hasidim recommends that he should make efforts to purchase or to copy of these texts and that his neighbor should reimburse him. So I think we're going to look at our reimbursement this morning, but here's reimbursement now. It's an inside joke. Anyway, um, but this interest in Tosfot, not just in Tosfot, is palpable in, this, in these examples. Rabbi Yona Hasid served as a judge of the rabbinic court in Regensburg, and he interacted with the Tosfists who served with him 
on that they did. And here, I uh, think that the section, say for Hasidim, I've written about this too, is not about so much Yudah Hasid simply winning over the Tosaf Islam that they did. There was a negotiation between them. There was halachic valence in there. He knows his halacha, and they interact not simply in pietistic uh, uh, pieces there. Uh, as I've shown, his fellow judges learned and adopted ideas and halachic constructs from him, just as he did from them. When Isaac and Moses or Zeru of Vienna was confronted with a question about determining the halakhic qualifications of prayer leader or Shaliyat Sibur, he briefly notes the view of his major teacher, the German Tosafist Simcha of Spire, while entirely avoiding the approach of Rabbi Tom and his followers in northern France. Isaac or Zeru alike knew of the French approach from his teacher, Judas Cyrilin of Paris, a leading student of Rive Dompierre. Rami Reiner has highlighted the extent to which Sefer or Zerua sought to preserve northern French materials of this type. But instead, he follows the halachic guidance in this matter of another of his teachers, Yudah Hasi, not the pietistic guidance, simply the halachic guidance. Although several of the citations from Yudah Hasi and Sefer or Zerua overall are centered on what we all agree are pietistic matters, Isaac de Vienna regards Judah as a key halachic resource in other instances, most notably concerning the writing and fabrication of Tfilin, despite the numerous toasts of his resources that he had at his disposal from both northern France and Germany. In fact, Isaac of uh, Vienna cites his teacher, Judah the Pious, in this area of Jewish law, for the most part, min haktav, from a written text or texts, question of whether Yudah Hasid wrote any halachic literature. People talk about Shmuel Hasid. He certainly wrote something here in the realm of halacha, and in one instance, citing the passage from Sefer Hasid, that is not found in any of the excellent versions, not in the whole Princeton database, nowhere, um, even though we should certainly not mistake Sefer Hasidim as a work of halacha. And so in confronting Sefer Hasidim and Halakha and what's in it and what's not in it, it's not a Sefer Halakha, so we don't expect to find all areas or many areas. But in the case of Tulin, Yudah Hasid himself clearly has some written material that he is transmitting. Uh, and in Hilchot Tulin as well, Isaac of Vienna compares and contrasts Judah's views with those of Simcha of Spire, Samson of Sons, among other German and French Tosavists. To be sure, Isaac or Zerua hailed from Central and Eastern Europe, and he studied first and foremost and longest in the Rhineland before traveling to Paris. A number of German Tosafists, aside from those in Regensburg, interacted with Judah Hasid on matters of Jewish law and practice, not Pietism. In addition to those inspired with whom he had intellectual and spiritual affinities, here I would mention Judah ben Kolonimus Rivak ben Meir. What I'd like to speak about today, however, is the extent to which Judah Hasid interacted with or impacted northern French Tosafists and what they, what they in turn thought of his halachic and Talmudic expertise, and by now you're all thinking it will be a very short paper. <laughs> in order to do so, we must first briefly recall that there was a 40-year period of disruption, something of a disconnect, if you will, between the key posts of the centers in northern France and those in Germany, following the death of Rabbi Tam in 1171. This so-called Tukufat HaNetek lasted until Orzeruai and others came to study in northern France in the second decade of the 13th century. One of the results of this separation, the causes of which have not been adequately explained, although I have not adequately pressed that, we'll press that we'll propose an overarch explanation, you have to wait for that, is that northern French Tosifists remained largely unaware of what their colleagues in Germany, their Tosifist colleagues, were doing during this period. This gap accounts for the noticeable absence of German Germanic figures, even important prolific ones, in the Tosfot, for example, to the standard editions of the Talmud, whose origins are almost entirely from northern France. They may have been edited elsewhere, but the materials are coming mainly from northern France, and because northern France doesn't know exactly what's happening in Germany, a lot of absence in the Tosfot. Simcha of Spire is perhaps the most noteworthy total omission. It doesn't get its reference at all in the scale of Tosfot, but no German Tosfist from this period is cited more than a handful of times, and the norm is two or three times at best. In the other direction, teachings of Rio Don Pierre do get through the Rhineland, where they are cited, for example, in Sefer Ravia, but not so much more. As such, the fact that Yudah Hasid is mentioned only twice in the standard Tosfot of the Talmud is not surprising. But let us look carefully at what these, what these citations tell us. The first thing they tell us is that they are both, they are both about the same issue, which means, in effect, that this is only one, there's only one point of reference to Yudah Hasid and Tosfot. The same holds true for his father, Samuel ben Kalanimus Hasid, but that is where the similarity ends. Shmuel Hasid is cited in the Tosfot passage, the Tosfot passage, the Tractate Yivamot, which seeks to clarify the age at which Rebecca married Isaac. 
Although the standard text of Seder Olam reports that she was three years old, Shmuel Achasid on the base of other Midrashic passages, and another version of Seder Olam concludes that her age was 14. The fact that Postal presents a scriptural or Midrashic interpretation from Shmuel Achasid does not, of course, tell us much about what the Tosafists thought of him as a Talmudist or Halachist. The situation with Yudah Hasid, however, is rather different. In both of the instances that I'm referring to, which, in which Tosafot cites Judah, he offers an interpretation relevant to the rather substantive Talmudic sugi at hand. The Talmudic discussion concerns whether one who may be suspect with regard to monetary matters is also suspect with regard, with regard to the reliability of an oath that he takes. Hashira Mamona, Hashira Shulata. The Talmud's assumption at this point is that these two suspicions do not necessarily flow one from another. A person who is suspected with regard to monetary matters is still able to take an oath because it can be assumed that he would be unwilling to go as far, so far as to swear falsely in God's name. This analysis is presented by Tosfot in the name of Rio Don Pierre. Tosfot then poses, poses a follow-up question. If so, if we don't suspect in that case, why do we not allow a known thief to take an oath? Money he takes, the oath he won't, he won't swear falsely. The first, the first answer given is according to, that according to Torah law, a thief can still take an oath uh, uh, in another matter, uh, in another matter, because Torah law would allow it. However, rabbinic law decrees that he should not be given this opportunity because of his past record. Tosfo then cites Judah Hasid as suggesting a different explanation. The Tirates Rabuda Hasid. When an oath is imposed regarding the same object or money for which there exists a suspicion that the individual took it for himself, case of a watchman who has to swear that he watched properly, took it for himself, the question is whether this suspicion will uh, nullify the oath. Judah says that an oath may not, nonetheless be administered because the specter of swearing a false oath will actually serve to deter the individual from taking the object altogether. In Judah's words, However, once an individual has already stolen an money or an object, it is unlikely that he will now come clean because he's afraid to take an oath. Instead, he will swear falsely to cover up his crime, below Yisrael Shalitei HaShfua. Judah's view is recorded even more expansively in the relatively early post of Samson of Sons and Tractate Kubo. Here's the quote. When the prospect of taking a false oath arises, a thief will not try to avoid punishment for that sin by returning the object that he has already stolen. But one who is not a thief will not take a false oath because he recognizes that one sin begets another, better that he should return the pledge and be completely resolved of any sin. Therefore, the oath that a watchman takes, in which he states that the object is not with him, can be trusted. Tosfot Shans then reports that the master, Rio Don Pierre, initially endorsed the solution of Yudah Hasid, the Hoderi Mitchila. Ri, however, ultimately rejects his interpretation because of a problem posed by another Talmudic passage, which other Tosafists were able to resolve. It would appear that somewhere before his death in 1189, and likely before the period of disruption that I talked about above, Ri of Don Pierre became aware of the solution proposed by Yudah Hasid, just as Judah, for his part, was aware of the essential Tosafist discussion. Although Ri rejects Judah's resolution in favor of the other position recorded in Tosafot, Ri and Judah are speaking the very same Tosafist language in this instance in a matter of Talmudic law and reasoning, certainly not a matter of pietism or ethics per se. Indeed, despite Ri's subsequent question, Judah's approach is recorded without any demoral in another Tosafot passage, in the second passage, alongside the other interpretation offered by Tosafot. And I should note that the Tosafot, where these are recorded by Metzia, are also based at least in part on Tosafot shots, and that's significant. It's a very important early French Tosafist collection that has no problem integrating uh, and does integrate with the Hasid. Moreover, both Nachmanis and Rashba and the Tamil Fidushim present the view of Yudah Hasid in the same terms, albeit not in his name, but the name of Ri's teacher, Rabbeinu Tam. I have not yet been able to find Rabbeinu Tam's name in any Tosafist text on this matter, but this development presents us with two important possibilities. First, that Rabbeinu Tam and Yudah Hasid said the very same thing independently, or that Ramban and Rashba, who are both quite familiar with and fluent in Tosafist formulations, thought that their views were the same. Either way, Judah Hasid sounds just like a Tosafist here, and perhaps like Rabbi Yitam. I should note that Urbach, as was his wont, seeks to correlate Judah Hasid's view in Tosafist in this discussion with a passage in Sefer Hasidin, which describes the pietistic behavior of shunning a person 
who frequently volunteers to take oaths that were not actually being required of him by other litigants. Orbach means to imply that Judah is being cited in this instance by Tosfot because of his heightened or exaggerated sensibilities about avoiding false oaths. However, to my mind, this imprecise parallel obscures the fact that Judah, at least in the instance that, instance that we've been describing, is considered by we and other Tosafists to be, quote, one of them. His argumentation, and even the terms that he uses, fit seamlessly with the Tosafist passages in which he is cited. And he is surely not referring in this case to any new or expanded religious directives. A passage in Tosafot Harash, beginning to track the Brachot, cites a practice of Yudah Hasid, that when he recited the verse of Shema following the Brachot in the introductory section of the morning prayers, he had in mind to thereby fulfill his obligation to recite Kriya Shema in the morning. This passage then goes on to note that since the recitation of Shema in its proper place within the liturgy was sometimes delayed due to the, rec due to the recitation of Piyutim, Judah recited the Shema at this earlier point, along with the phrase Baruch Shem Kohen Machutol Elam Ba'ed, which served to confirm that he meant to fulfill his obligation. Judah did not feel that the blessings of the Shema had to be recited at that time, relying upon the view of Judah the Prince, Brachot 13b, that when one was otherwise engaged in study or prayer, it was sufficient to say the first verse of Shema in a timely manner in order to fulfill this precept. The discussion within Tosfot HaRosh then returns to the recitation of Shema in the evening, which is at the center of the discussion of the standard of Tosfot HaRosh as well. The purpose of presenting this view of Yudah Hasid is to buttress the approach of Rashi regarding the recitation of Shema in the evening. That according to Rashi, the Shema recited after nightfall upon retiring, which was not recited with its blessings, is sufficient to fulfill the obligation to recite Shema in the evening. As we know, and Yaakov Katz, of course, made this a little bit more accessible in my Rabbi Rabbeinu Tamanov has held that it was prefer uh, preferable to rely on a full recitation of Shema after sunset, but before nightfall with all of the blessings, rather than to follow Rashi's approach. Here, too, Yudah Hasid's view fits into the discussion within Tostana Rosh and is taken quite seriously as a matter of ritual practice appropriately derived from Talmudic law. Although Yudah's concern here arose in part at least because of the pietistic tendency in Germany to recite Piyutim slowly at great length, which might cause the prayers, especially on festivals, to, as we have been doing in this conference, run along, an issue that was raised directly with Judah by contemporary German Tosafists such as Baruch and Mainz. The solution presented was deemed to be fully acceptable within a Tosafist context, and indeed, Judah's view was discussed by subsequent Ashkenazic Halachists as well. The essential stream of Tosfot Harosh is based in large measure again on Tosfot Shantz, as a number of scholars have noted, although it is certainly possible that Asher and Yechiel, the Rosh himself, may have added this at some point to an earlier French formulation. Nonetheless, Judah's approach and his words again have the quality of a very friendly amendment to the Tosfot's discussion, if not of a passage that was included in the original substrate of the French Tosfot. One other example, and I can list others, but let's just do one more. Tosfot, so I also want to point out, it's a matter of prayer, but it's the chot filah. It's a matter of the chot priyat shema. It's not a matter of how to read the prayer. And the same thing is true for the next example. Tosfot Menachot discusses the custom of reciting tzitkat chatzedek, a brief prayer composed of verses that acknowledge the righteousness of God's decrees and decisions, uh, which we need to recognize, which is cited on Shabbat afternoon toward the end of Mincha service, noting that Rav Sar Shalom the only discussed with the fact that Moshe Rabbeinu passed away on Shabbat, and so this prayer functions as a kind of a Sidu Kadin, which the Jewish communities recite to mark the passing of their greatest teacher. Tosfot then proceeds to interrogate this datum about the day of the week on which Moses, Moses passed away. They don't you get away with anything, Tosfot. On the basis of verses of the book of Joshua, passages in Seder Olam, other Midrashic sources, rabbinic calendric considerations, concluding that Moses actually passed away on a Friday. But we still say Tzidkat Hatzedek, but there's no suggestion that the custom should be abandoned. This Tosfot passage is marked by the initials, the initials Menlesh, signifying in this instance that it was recorded by Samson of Sons from his teacher in the year. Yeah. Several sources, including a passage in Sefer or Zarua, wherein Isaac of Vienna reports that he heard this Mipi from the mouth of his teacher, Yudah Hasid, attribute this interrogation and its conclusion in almost precisely the same terms and on the basis of the very same sources to Yudah Hasid, a passage in the name of a Rabbi Samuel, probably Samuel of Bomberg and not Samuel of Rome, as one scholar suggested, well, this would be very helpful to my argument, reports that he had, he had a copy of this analysis in Yudah Hasid's own handwriting. 
Mikdivat Yado. Uh, there are several other similar examples that I will skip. I will just note I found a very interesting piece uh, in manuscript in a Tosfot, well, in a comment of Yudah Chassid to a passage in Masechet Yevamot about Pesach and about the original Pesach. And here, it's not that Yudah imitates Tosfot or they quote him, but if you close your eyes, you wonder why did the Tosfot ask the same question and give the same answer. Again, the idiom there is quite remarkable. Are we dealing here with mere coincidences or with great minds thinking alike? Or, as in the examples that I present, some of them is this further evidence for very close imitation, if not for direct contact. Whether or not Samson of Psalms was happy, halachically and aesthetically, with the lengthy caparos like prayer shawls that Hasidi Ashkenaz wore, and we have his response to that the Simcha has pointed out was put into a different collection, comes out in Shabbat Maram, French Kosovists appear to have been more than satisfied with the bona fides of Yudah Hasid as a Talmudic scholar and halachist, whose reasoning and formulations were fully compatible with theirs. And now I go to the second and last part. Yudah Hasid died in 1217 in Regensburg, but his stature in the eyes of 13th century Tosifus in northern France, as an authority of halakha and rabbinic tradition, remains high. Uh, in previous writings, I've presented extensive evidence for the affinities that, Tos that the Tosifus Beit Midrash and Evro had, um, with the but here I want to talk about halakhic practice and religious observance in 13th century northern France and connection to Yudah Hasid. The fish known as the barbuto or albuta, which apparently had scales at one point on a limited portion of its body, or which shed its scales entirely was pulled from the water, was deemed to be kosher, according to Rashi Rashbam Rabbi Nutan. Ephraim of Regensburg, who studied for Rabbi Nutan in northern France, later sought to take this French permission and bring it over to Germany, where they didn't eat this fish. Um, and there's a whole story here. There's a dream. He allowed it. He had a dream. Uh, and we all know the result was he didn't eat it ever again. But this was a dream function. Ches uh, Haland, I'm known to be a Huda, says it's a little bit unfair that Ephraim got a dream. How come Rabbi Nathan didn't get a dream that he was right? In any case, that's not my point. In any case, the permissibility, that's a known story. Here's a lesser known story. Uh, in any case, the permissibility of this fish was revisited in northern France during the mid-13th century. It's another iteration. At this point, the dream and actions of Ephraim of Regensburg play no role whatsoever in the discussion. Rather, a determination associated directly with the Yudah Hasid uh, played the main role. Uh, uh, Rabbeinu Peretz, Ben Eliyahu of Corbet, died in 1297, heard the yesterday about him, who was also, for the record, a student in Evro, uh, reports, and we have this in several texts, and Yudah confirmed it as well in the manuscripts, that, and it's also in Hagahot, the Tashbet, the Hagahot, Rabbeinu Peretz, the Tashbet, no doubt about it, that even though the leading rabbis of Harabanim Hagdolid in northern France do eat this fish, Moraine were be filming Paris, died around 1260, did not. Citing the rule in the Vyura Hasid that kosher fish possess an additional physical characteristic that establishes their permissibility. According to Judah's teaching, these also require a tail that is split into two sections. Rabbuta doesn't have that. Therefore, Yefim of Paris ruled that this can't be eaten. Although Yefim of Paris was quite skittish about adopting stringent positions that in his view did not have appropriate rabbinic derivation of court sources, referring on occasion to those who promulgated such customs as Osrim Shotim, foolish prohibitors, he adopts Yudah Hasid's rulings regarding the Marbuta against the standard practice in northern France that had been ratified during the 12th century by all the leading Tosifists and extended back to Rashi. A passage in Sacred Mitzvot Gadol by Moses of Kusi, who's a contemporary Yefiel, clearly demonstrates just how significant the change Yefiel ruling represented. Sacred Mitzvot Gadol uh, ratifies and endorses the leading friend position, noting at the very end of the passage that, quote, nonetheless, this fish is not permitted everywhere because in Germany, the Ashkenaz, the custom is not to eat it. Apparently, the restrictive German custom uh, uh, had made little, if any, headway in northern France in the mid 13th century until the Yechil of Paris accepted and adopted the positions of Yudah Hasid, position of Yudah Hasid, even though it stood firmly against that of his northern French predecessor. And here, because of time, I'll skip. Yudah Hasid, most of Kusi doesn't quote Yudah Hasid, but he does quote him in his Perush al Torah. He takes one of his biblical comments and he reproduces it verbatim in Yudah's name. Uh, we also have a very interesting uh, comment. Um, in, uh, in Smog, in Moses of Kusi's commentary, a very difficult verse in Numbers 26, uh, that uh, Amram married Yocheved, the daughter of Levi, Asher Yalda, Otoa Levi, Yimitzrayim. There's a talk of a dangling, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
the antecedent there, and uh, uh, Yudah Hasid and Moses of Kusi both say that Ota was the name of Amram's uh, wife. Uh, now, you know, again, Moses of Kusi, Kosbis, a Pashtan, uh, is quoting quite clearly, quoting quite exactly from there. And again, I'll skip all of this, but in the Tosafist, French Tosafist collections of Torah commentaries, Yudah Hasid plays a tremendous role. Uh, I'll just say that Panea Haraza, one such connection, um, mentions him as one of the uh, Avnei Yisod, as one of the key resources in his collection, along with Joseph of Horshor of Olean, Jacob and Solomon of Olean, and Yom Tov of Joani. So three French students are already in town, and Yudah Hasid, and nobody is getting too worried about it. Uh, again, biblical comments are not quite as important for our discussion as Talmud or Halacha comments, and so let me go to the uh, conclusion here. Uh, first thing I want to say is, if you then look at Elazar of Orms, of course Elazar is not Yehuda, uh, Elazar wrote Tosfot, we have fragments, pieces recorded in Shittim of but it's possible to expand parts of Masachet Baba Kama. And elsewhere, again, there is Misha, there is certainly interaction between French Tosfot's texts, Never mind, Lazar was a halachist, and we tend to look at him as a very German halachist, and he was, although his Rokeach quotes French material much less than the various uh, treatises that Emesh Kozma published, somebody handed up yesterday. Um, so, uh, you know, certainly if you move forward, the Gisha is there. In closing, let me be very clear that I do not think that Yudah Hasid was a Tosifist, nor do I believe that the Northern French Tosifist is a group or devotees of Hasidic Ashkenaz. What I'm suggesting, however, is that some of the categories and distinctions used to distinguish between these groups of figures are perhaps been constructed too narrow. And that's never fun because it makes it more difficult, but we're here to be difficult. This reflects in part a failure to properly recognize the extent of the intellectual and spiritual creativity among the Tosafists, uh, coupled with an under-assessment under of Yudah Hasid's interests and training. And that's why I've avoided Sefer Hasidim. Look at Yudah. It's a very interesting biography. Um, and just to sort of try to, I was trying to think about, so why did he do this? What happened to him? So since we're sitting at the Hebrew University of you know, Jerusalem, I'll say it this way. Yudah Hasid Asa Toa Rishon Be Fakulta Le Talmud Le Tosfo. La Para Chakas La Sot Abdarat Le Chasidut Prishut Le Chadome. But the point is, these are separate parts of his, separate but possibly integrated parts of his biography. And what I'm suggesting here is, when we talk about Yudah Hasid, never mind Sefer Hasidim, I think we have to consider some of these things with a little more clarity. Thank you very much. And not just because Ahuva gave such a nice talk. In other words, eh, I purposely left it out for that reason because that is the you know that's the folklore department uh, or the you know intellectual folklore department. Um, it's it's hard to place him there. Uh, to my mind, what's most important here is the transmission of texts. And uh, I'll let you in a little secret. My solution to the net tech is going to be it's, it's not a political blockade. It's not an economic blockade. It's not a temporal blockade. It's a matter of teachers. You know, in one word, Germans went to France to study. After they studied with Rabbi Tom in France, they went back and taught their students in Germany. So the next generation didn't have to go to northern France because they had teachers there. 
The Germans didn't like to teach. They were, you know, like me, university professor. They liked to teach. Anyway, they were dayanim. They were not. They were not Rashi Yeshiva. So after a while, they run out of gas, and Orzo has got to come back to France to learn again from the French teachers. And that will even explain a little bit Simcha's wonderful article about the change in Germany. But in any case, so it's a matter of text. Yura Hasi doesn't have to get to France, but in other words. They know about him through text, he knows about them through text, which is really your, your second question, what are the textual movements between places? And there we have, what's that? that and, who, and, who, and who's moving, right. So it's almost like Nehute, but except it's not clear who's the Nehute and who are the Olim, you know. So in any case, that's the way I think it happens. So, so I'd love to find him in France, I don't think we will, even though it's, you know, an Etiyah, Rash, uh, Shmuel um, Hasid uh, also showed up. Everybody showed up, you know. Uh, everybody went to Rashi, you know, they made a Hagel It didn't work that way. But the texts do move, and so the question is identifying, and, and as far as the Regensburg, that connection, that's a very important connection. In other words, uh, Ephraim of Regensburg is sitting with tons of French stuff, and, and once Ephraim is in Regensburg, netek or not, and it's even before the netek, there's going to be discussion between the centers. In other words, the people in Regensburg know who the players in France are, and vice versa. And the people in France certainly know who the people of Sparta are. By the way, Elazar of Worms studies with two students of Rabbeinu Tam, Eliezer of Metz, and the much lesser known, he was very important as a teacher, Moshe Cohen of Magensa. So the French stuff is coming into the Rhineland, forget that the distance isn't that great, back and forth. So I think with the textual he showed, which we don't have to go into folklore for, we're in a safe place. We're in a safe place. But thank you. Good. What is it? Oh.